Om Ganata Vivendasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Meditam Yena Tasmai Shigurve Namaha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada, who so kindly opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So thank you very much, Nityananda Prana. I hope I can live up to his introduction. <laughs> it's going to be hard. One thing he didn't mention in the introduction is I like to tell a lot of jokes, which to me is the most fun thing. So what we're going to do for the next day or two, that's today and tomorrow. Of course, the schedule is 10.30, which it happens to be 10.40, 10.30 to 12.30 and 2.30 to 4.30 both days. Everybody got it? And I guess everybody knows the bathroom is over there in case I freak people out and there's a problem. <laughs> You can just run and cry, and uh, one of the ladies will have tissues stay, if you cry during the seminar. So, we're, what we're going to do is have fun. This seminar is about fun, is about being happy, and that's what you'll get out of it if you can connect with what we're teaching. So, a little bit of my own history, and as you notice, I don't like sitting down when I'm doing seminars because you all will fall asleep. You most professional presenters, they walk around during, during seminars, during presentations. Because nowadays, the average uh, span of attention for an individual is, I think, about five, six seconds. <laughs> when I joined the Hare Krishna movement, it was, I would say, a minute. And now it's five or six seconds. And that's due to the media. And nowadays, not so many people read books anymore. There was a recent survey, like 50% of Americans haven't read a book in the last year. So it's a challenge. So in any case, here's my background, not my academic background, not that I went to Northwestern University, which was a waste of time. Uh, <laughs> but I was here during the installation of Kishore Kishori. Not here, it was in Evanston. And I did go on the altar, dress the deities and everything like that, so I was one of the people who helped prepare for Kachor Kachori's installation. And I forget which year was that? Any? 73. 73, and you were two years old then or something? Yes. Did your mother take you to the temple? Yes. Good. <laughs> I know you were somewhere else. So, a uh, little bit of my own history. I joined the movement in 1971. And my first intention when I joined the movement was to get liberated from the material world. Because I understood the material world was miserable. Now why did I understand the material world was miserable? Because people were demanding things of me throughout my life, particularly my dear mother, who's still alive, and I love her very much. But, you know, a lot of pressure, like many of you, who come from India will understand pressure and how you were pressured as children to excel. I had one, one friend from India who, uh, his parents pressured him to be a doctor. So he went through medical school, you know, for eight years, got out of medical school, and he said to his parents, I did this for you, and now I'm gonna do what I wanna do. <laughs> so he never practiced as a doctor. So, of course, my uh, experience in childhood was something like that. You know, my mother, I also came from an Indian family. It doesn't look like it, but also my parents were the similar mentality. Uh, and they pressured me, you've got to be a doctor, you've got to be a doctor. And I would say to my parents, why do I have to be a doctor? And my parents, my mother, sorry, not both my parents, my mother, <laughs> she would say mothers are heavier than fathers, generally. My mother would say, to please me. Sound familiar? <laughs> I can see I struck a, struck a, a note there. So, uh, and I would say, why? And she would say, that's your duty in life. And I would say, why? And she said, because you're supposed to. And I would say, why again? And I get the same answer. And she got really frustrated and angry. <laughs> So, whoops. 
a musical interlude. Yes, if we can turn all the phones, at least softer. So, so throughout life it was like that. I had to do so many things, or at least I thought I had to do so many things. And I thought, I just want to get liberated. So I joined the Hare Krishna movement, and I was told, back to home, back to Godhead. You can get anything you want if you go back to Godhead. There's a desire tree there, many trees. There's uh, surabi cows. You can get ice cream, milk, pizza from the cows, anything you want. Isn't that nice? So I was very attracted to getting out of the material world and going back to the place where you could just rub Aladdin's lamp. Everybody knows about Aladdin? You know, rub a lamp, a genie comes out. Of course, in the story of Aladdin, the genie kills you on the third wish, but... <laughs> But I was very attracted to going back to the spiritual world. So I chanted very enthusiastically, my dear Lord Krishna, please take me back to the spiritual world. When I would go to sleep at night as a brahmachari, I would pray to Krishna, my dear Lord, kill me tonight. <laughs> so I can go back to Godhead. So definitely a desire for liberation, okay? To get out of the material world. So I, as I progressed, in Krishna consciousness, hopefully I progressed, then uh, my sort of desires sort of uh, changed. In the beginning it was liberation, and then the next step was the Sunday feast. You know what I say? <laughs> and the next, the next step after that was, what was the next step? The next step after that was basically how can I help people become Krishna conscious? You know, I started to develop some empathy for other people. Now that's interesting, because in the beginning, I don't know if I had too much empathy for other people, it was all about me. That was my Krishna conscious. Of course, Krishna also says that in the Gita. He says four types of people approach him, right? Chatur Bidha Bhajanti Mam. People looking for wealth, people who are inquisitive, people who are looking for knowledge, or people in distress. So, of course, I was looking for knowledge and also, you know, I guess a little bit distress. I wasn't looking for wealth, and I wasn't, a, you know, I guess it was a little inquisitive. So, those are my motives. So, as you chant sincerely, what is it? Akama, Amoksha Kama, Dharadi, Sarva Kama, Tivrena Bhakti Yogena Yajeta Purusham Param. Whatever your desire is, somehow it gets purified. It works. Krishna consciousness works. You should be assured of that. Like Dhruva Maharaj, he was Sarvakam. He wanted everything. He wanted a kingdom greater than Lord Brahma. And what did he get? He got it. But then he said, I was looking for some pieces of broken glass and I have found a beautiful gem or diamond. So it works. So anyway, so kept chanting, and I was thinking, I really want to help people. And then I looked around to all the devotees, and I said, I want to help them too. <laughs> because I saw there were conflicts. Now, conflicts are not bad. You know, people sometimes think, oh, we shouldn't have any conflicts. Well, if we didn't have any conflicts, we would be like robots. Computers. Well, I have conflicts with my computers sometimes, but that's a different <laughs> issue. <laughs> Did you ever want to smash your computer? Let's go, boom. So it, we need conflicts. Conflicts keep us alive, like internal conflicts. Should I do this? Should I do that? And external conflicts. You have one opinion, I have another opinion. Let's do a win-win. It's how you resolve conflicts. So I became interested in resolving conflicts because I saw conflicts within the devotee community. Now, obviously, I saw conflicts outside of the devotee community. I mean, just read CNN or any you know, website that has the news <laughs> full of conflicts. Keeps you interested reading about all the conflicts. It's very humorous sometimes. But in the Krishna consciousness movement, it's not humorous. Because, why is it not humorous? Because when we have unresolved conflicts, it impedes the progress of the Krishna consciousness movement. Prabhupada said, and he was 
uh, saying this in the purport in the Upadesha Amrita, Nectar of Instruction, uh, that our movement moves forward through loving exchanges, you know, dadati pratigranati guyam akyati prachati bhunte bhujate chada, giving prasadam, accepting prasadam, revealing one's mind and confidence, hearing from others and confidence, giving gifts and accepting gifts. So I understood that loving exchanges, which is what Prabhupada said in the purport, is how our movement progresses or remains stable and how the devotees remain stable in Krishna conscious. So in order to sort of solve this or deal with this issue, I started to investigate conflict resolution. Now, the first thing I did when I uh, started investigating conflict resolution is I took some courses in mediation, not meditation, they're spelled differently. Mediation means, I mean, there's two types of mediation. One type is you're just dealing with a particular issue. For example, uh, let's say, Nichananda Prana, I bought your car and it needs a new battery. And you didn't tell me that. So I want a refund of some of my money. And so you say, no, you bought it as is, where is? And so we're having a big fight due to that just about the battery of the car. And so what happens is you need a mediator. Okay, mediator, mediator comes in, says, okay, what do you want to do about this battery? And I say, all right, I'll take half the money. Nichananda Brown says, I'll give you half the money. Okay, shake hands. Okay, boss. That's mediation. So I took some courses in mediation. I became a certified mediator. And what I thought after I became a certified mediator, I took the ISKCON courses, you know, I have my certificate from Arnold Zack, you know about that already, and, you know, I can get a job now. A little too old, but my, <laughs> I am on Social Security, you know, so. So, uh, I thought this is not going to really resolve differences, because I wanted not just to deal with one particular conflict that people had. I wanted to deal with relations between devotees, you know, loving relations. You know, just me making a deal with Nityananda Pran about the battery, it doesn't solve our relationship problem. I want to have a good relationship with him. So, therefore, there's another type of mediation, which is called transformational mediation, which is much more difficult, which means taking a lot of time so then I started a research into transformational mediation and how to deal with interpersonal conflicts. And I came across uh, the teachings. This is a little history, so you know where I'm coming from. I came across the teachings of Marshall Rosenberg, who was a psychologist. He passed away recently. And I read them, his teachings are called Nonviolent Communication. Uh, and he's written many books about nonviolent communication. So I decided to attend some training sessions, like 10 day training sessions, where we would just eat and sleep, uh, you know, all together doing this nonviolent communication. Of course, not everybody there was a devotee. In fact, nobody there was a devotee, or maybe I was, if you can call me a devotee. So it presented some challenges to me, like, you know, not all of them were vegetarians. So as soon as someone started eating something non-vegetarian, I couldn't restrain myself, and I yelled out, what about empathy for the chicken? <laughs> and they all said, shut up. <laughs> and I said, what about empathy for me? So, <laughs> so there, were, there were some challenges attending, <laughs> attending these workshops. So anyway, I got trained up by Marshall Rosenberg personally, learned some aspects of nonviolent communication, and then decided to integrate them, utilizing the philosophy and teachings of our acharyas like Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So I came across, uh, in some of Bhaktivinoda Thakur's works, uh, similar statements about how everything we do feel is based upon needs. See, there's needs here. And these are needs here. So, uh, and 
Bhaktivinoda Thakur said the same thing, basically, in his Chaitanya Shikshamrita. And he stated something very interesting for me, that if we want to be stable in Krishna consciousness, it is important to satisfy our basic needs, which we'll explain in a second, as well as our more spiritual needs. This is the need triangle. Uh, and that's very interesting. And that very much works into Varnashram. Whoops. Everyone, your phone is talking to me. Thank you. So, uh, this very much works into Varnashram. Everybody knows what Varnashram is. Varnashram means engaging people according to their psychophysical nature. Everybody has a psych, you know, your brahmacharya is uh, Rahasthavanaprasa sannyasis or Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shooters. Everyone's engaged according to their psychophysical nature. So, in Varnashram, we understand people have certain needs. And that's what Srila Prabhupada said, that 50% of his mission was not done because Varnashram was not established, because people were not put in situations where they can continue to execute Krishna consciousness year after year in a steady way. I mean, you're all familiar with the story, with the story of the tortoise and the hare. You know, there's this hare, it means rabbit. And the rabbit and the tortoise are engaged in a race. And there's a finish line, and the rabbit goes, you know, really fast, and he just takes a nap. He's taking prashadam at midday or something like that. And the tortoise, the tortoise just keeps on going and going and he wins the race. Slow and steady, the motto of that story is the slow and steady wins the race, right? And sometimes, or not sometimes, but many times we actually think we're more advanced or more transcendental than we actually are. There's an actually interesting quote. Uh, and this quote, I want to read this to you if I can find it. This quote is from uh, Maslow, who is one of my favorite psychologists, because Maslow analyzed this whole theory. He was the one who came up with this hierarchy of needs, which is similar to what Bhakti Vinod Thakur talks about, which is similar to uh, Marshall Rosenberg's understanding, which is similar to what I'm presenting. So Maslow said here, this is such an interesting statement, and it's from his book called Tortoise Psychology of Being. A kind of pseudo growth, pseudo means false, takes place very commonly when a person tries by repression, denial, to convince himself that an ungratified basic need has really been gratified. Let me unpack that. So many people convince themselves, I'm really transcendental, I'm above all this. You know, I don't need to sleep or eat. I don't need any of these things. This is all maya. Whatever you're presenting, Maharaj, is that basically maya. Whoop. So, that's all right. So it's basically maya. I don't need air, food, light, water, rest, shelter, protection, movement. I don't need play. What is this nonsense play stuff? fun, or recreation, you know. Does anyone here think like that? He thinks like that. Two people think like that. All right, you're in Maya. So, <laughs> that's the way I deal with people who don't agree with me. They're nonsense, they're in Maya, they're rascals, they're jackasses. I, I'm really expert in this stuff. <laughs> Maya Purchandra will tell you. Incidentally, Maya Purchandra is the son of Shruta Kirti Prabhu, who is Prabhupada's servant, and Chambakalata is the daughter of Mother Irmala. Or Irmala probably. They're, they're actually celebrities, and I've agreed to I've agreed to travel with them. So <laughs> by their mercy. Anyway. So let me continue reading this. So, so we convince ourselves that we have some basic needs, 
that they've already been gratified or they don't exist. Sleeping? What do I need to sleep for? I mean, how many devotees have gotten in automobile accidents because they didn't need to sleep? Automobile accidents. We had, in the early days, there were devotees who died and we, the devotee said to Prabhupada, Krishna's mercy. And you know what Prabhupada said? Their foolishness. You know, you can't blame everything on Krishna, you know. Oh, if you overate, oh, it's Krishna's mercy, I always <laughs> Or like the Christians, what do they say? The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. We, we also say Maya made me do it. So we have a devil too in the Krishna consciousness. So let me continue reading. He then, persists, then he permits himself to grow onto higher level needs, which of course forever, forever after rest on a very shaky foundation. Does everybody understand what I just said? Uh, I call this pseudo growth. This is pseudo growth because it bypasses, it bypasses the ungratified need, such a need perseveres forever as an unconscious force like repetition, compulsion. And you see that because what happens when an ungratified need, let's, in a second I'll talk about what needs are. Well, when an ungratified need is not fulfilled, you know, you have this whole verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Jayato Vishayat Punsang Sangostesha Pajayate, Sangat Sanjayate, Kama, Kama Krota Bijayate. When you have an ungratified need or desire, and uh, you get angry after a while, right? You get angry. So haven't we seen people like angry all the time? If you just say, Prabhu, can you pass the spoon? What are you doing? Do it yourself, you nonsense. You know, anger comes from ungratified needs. It's a fact. We're going to talk about that later on how to deal with anger. It's one of the uh, aspects of the seminar or workshop or whatever you call it. Uh, ungratified need. So let's talk about what a need is because this is a very important part of this course. Like needs are different than desires. Like someone can say, I mean, like the other day I went to Mayapur who happens to be very rich and and I said to him, I need a Tesla. Everybody knows what a Tesla is? If you don't know what it is, it's a very expensive, really top of the line, battery operated car. I need that. Is that a need? No. That is a desire. We have a lot of desires. There's an unlimited desires. Krishna says, you know, the mode of passion, we have unlimited desires. I want this. You know, every time I see a car, I want it. A fancy car. Not any car. Probably not your car, but... <laughs> so it's, that's unlimited. But I don't need it. What I need is transportation. So the idea is to drill down to understand what our basic needs are, what we really need. And the way to do that, I'll give you a fancy way to figure out what your basic needs are. If someone says, let's say if your wife says, I, I need a new sari. <laughs> you really want to frustrate her. But anyway, so she says, I, I, I need a new sari. So-and-so has gotten a sari. And you know, I just have these old things that have been here in the closet for three years or 10 years or whatever, you just say why, like I did with my mother. And she said, because, she'll say, because uh, I feel so bad that I have this old sorry. And then you just say, why? Why? And you keep asking why, and finally you probably get to the point of something here called acceptance. That's a basic need. You understand? She wants to be accepted by her peers because if she walks in with the same old sari that she's been wearing for 30 years, 
You know, everyone will be talking behind their back like they do in Indian culture, isn't it? They say, you see that sorry she wore? You know, <laughs> so she wore acceptance and appreciation, community. So there's, there's, those are needs. Now, the desire is one thing, the need is another thing. And so you can fulfill that need by other strategies, which we're going to be talking about. But the first point is to accept that we all have these basic needs. I mean, I can say I have all these needs and I have different strategies for fulfilling them. I certainly have need for air, food, water, touch, rest, shelter, protection, and movement. And I'm moving now, I'm doing all those things now. I'm breathing, I ate this morning, I took water this morning, all these things. And I have a need for play and fun, which you're seeing now as I'm giving the seminar. Because <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun. I don't do anything. And by the end, actually, by the end of the seminar, you're going to learn that you won't have to do anything to have fun. You won't have to chant your rounds to be Krishna conscious. Uh, anyway, don't worry. <laughs> You won't have to be a vegetarian. You won't <laughs> have to worship Krishna. To be Krishna conscious, that's interesting. <laughs> so let's do a little thing right, right now. You can, Shambhaka Lata can write nicely. So I want to hear from all of you what you have to do in life. And let's just use the word have to do. And I'm deliberately phrasing it like that. Yeah. I'm deliberately phrasing it like that. Remember, I'm not saying don't chant your rounds. <laughs> I'm not saying that it's not necessary to chant rounds to become Krishna conscious. I'm just phrasing it in such a way as a have to. Because when you do things, because you have to do them, you're going to be a miserable camper. So what do you have? Let's have some volunteers here. Yeah, who has to do things in their life? life? We're okay. Well, they, I could probably hear without a microphone. She has to wake up in the morning. Oh, that's horrible. When you get more advanced in Krishna consciousness, you don't have to do that anymore. You have to what? You have to work. All right, who has to do something else? Yes. I have to stick with happy people. You have to stick with happy people? <laughs> That's pretty good. I have to buy my guru a Tesla. <laughs> 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 they don't have to put that one down. That was just a joke. So, uh, he has to earn money to buy the Tesla. He has to earn money to maintain his family, is that right? You got all these like hungry mouths, just, it's like a little bird. <laughs> you know, the bird lays an egg and the egg is hatch, and there, there's all the <laughs> And unfortunately, the birds that you have to deal with go to the university and everything like that. <laughs> Be one thing just to get worms for the birds. <laughs> but they, these, are, these are hungry birds for 20 years. You have to mortgage your house to feed the birds. Anyway. So, I think it's better to be a bird than a human being, isn't it? So, what are the, what are the, nobody else has to do anything? Yeah. I have to distribute books. You have to distribute books. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> Any of the brahmacharis have to do things? You have to use the toilet. You have to use the toilet. That's the first time anyone came up with that one. <laughs> the bathroom's right over here. So, any other, any other volunteers? Yes. You have to cook for who? She has to cook for the family. Oh my God. Yeah. You have to sleep. 
Any, any ha other have to, you know, that are really deep in your life that you're thinking, oh, I have to do that. I hate to do that. I have to do that. No one? Yeah. You have to clean the house. Yeah. You have to what? You have to deal with your children. This is being broadcast, so unfortunately. <laughs> okay, maybe one more have to, yeah. I have to deal with my wife, the wife. Is your wife here? Uh, I think you have to go to counseling after this. So. <laughs> okay. So all these have tos. Oh, one more. Okay. I have to power the sport. You have to deal with what? The cold weather. The cold weather. I have to deal with cold weather. Okay. So I, I decided I'm not going to have to do anything. How's that pretty good? So I'll tell you what, why I'm giving this seminar here. Actually, Nijananda Pran invited me for many years, but you know, I don't have to listen to him. So, <laughs> so, so my, <laughs> Romapad Maharaj kept asking me. That's really why I'm here. And I have to listen. No. <laughs> I chose. See, there's a different way to phrase this. It makes it really pleasant. You don't have to write it, but they'll get the idea. Is that the things I have to do, I don't want to do. Why? There's an interesting thing here. See this word? Autonomy. Does everybody know what the word means? It means making my own choices in life. So anything that I was forced to do when I was young, I don't do now. Because I had to, you know, like my mother said, you have to become a doctor. Okay, I'll become a Hare Krishna. <laughs> I'm just because of that have to, I became a, no. What, you know, I'm, I'm rebellious. My mother said, you have to eat beet soup. Is another thing. When I was young, my mother said, you know, beet soup is called borscht. I don't know if you ever heard of that word before. Some of you may, may not. And she forced me to eat it. And every time I see it now, what do I do? I scream. Every time I see beets, if someone says, beets are very healthy. <laughs> I hate them. <laughs> because when you approach life, see, life is meant to be fun. We want to get to the point of, I want to do this, I choose to do this, because it fulfills a certain need. So let's go through these things here. I'll oh, choose, all right. So I have to wake up in the morning. So instead of that, what can we say? I choose to wake up in the morning. But you have to give it a reason. You can't just say, I choose to wake up in the morning. I choose to wake up in the morning because I have a need for, what's a good one? Well, do I take care of your family? Yeah, but what are these basic needs? You know, love, community. Because, yes, that's also a basic need to care. Care, care for others. You know, integrity, creativity, meaning, self-worth. It's very important. This integrity business is very important. Like when you lie or cheat, you don't feel good about yourself. You know, you feel really uneasy. And so you can't really be happy when you're lying and cheating. That's one thing if you see someone who's a liar and a cheater. Generally, they're very miserable because they're not fulfilling that basic need. So I choose to wake up in the morning because I care for my family. I want to take care of them. Like, I, I choose I have to work and pay these bills, like Nityananda Pran said, because I want my children 
to be happy. You know, that's a basic need. I want my children to be happy and grow up and be functional in this world. And so that's love. So when you connect, I have to, using choose to, the, the, the energy changes. So you choose to go on Sankirtan. Why am I choosing to go on? What's the reason? Anyone can think of why I would choose to go on Sankirtan? Or you would choose to go on Sankirtan? No. Why would you choose to go on Sankirtan? Any? Yeah. Sharing the compassion. Another one? Do you have any other reasons why you choose to go on Sankirtan? It's, yeah, it gives me happiness, joy. Yes, yeah, you please your spiritual mind. You connect with your spiritual master. I choose to wake up in the morning. Why? I mean, this is a different concept the brahmacharis could have when they wake up from Mangalarki instead of thinking, you know, oh my God, ungodly hour, four, thirty, four o'clock in the morning. I choose because I want to connect with Krishna. You know, that's, of course, that's all the way up there. But also, you know, celebration, you're celebrating, it's community, it's play, fun, all those other things. And movement, you get a chance to dance. So getting up from Mangalarti fulfills a lot of those things, doesn't it? See? I wasn't so bad, was I? So, <laughs> so th this is very, very important to understand that whatever we do, however we think, whatever we say, is inspired by a desire to fulfill these needs. Or certain feelings come from not having needs fulfilled. So it's very, this is at the center of nonviolent communication, empathic communication, which is how I branded it, and what Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about in Chaitanya Shikshamrita and Marshall Rosenberg's teachings. The center is that we act according to our needs. And needs need to be fulfilled to progress in spiritual life. Hmm. So, also, uh, as I mentioned before, I noticed in ISKCON, going on to a different subject, that uh, people were not really conscious of these needs. Oh, and another point I wanted to make about need fulfillment is from the eighth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam about the story of Gajendra Moksha the liberation of Gajendra the elephant, that because Gajendra was in the water, which was not his natural environment, or making a metaphor, his needs weren't being fulfilled, he was able to be attacked by the crocodile. And Prabhupada makes a metaphor in that particular uh, part of the Bhagavatam that people need to be in the proper ashram to be able to deal with maya. Prabhupada used the words fight with maya, but deal with maya. And so Gajendra was not in the proper, he was in the proper ashram, obviously, <laughs> but he wasn't in the proper situation according to his psychophysical needs because he was an animal of the water, of the gland, sorry, of the land. And the crocodile was an animal of the water. So we all need to recognize and develop strategies for our basic needs. So uh, I noticed not only in ISKCON and other religious organizations that uh, there were many unempathic, or let's describe what empathy is before I start talking about this. Empathy means to actually understand other people's feelings and needs. Not necessarily taking them on yourself. Sympathy means basically how you feel about other people's feelings and needs. I'll give you an example. Let's say I go to the hospital to visit someone. One of you is in the hospital and you're, you have some disease and you're suffering some pain. And sympathy would mean that I would say, I feel really bad about what you're experiencing here. That's sympathy. That doesn't really help someone because now there's two people who are feeling bad. <laughs> Isn't it? You know, someone goes to you and says, I feel really bad. I feel so sad for you. 
you know, but, but if someone tries to understand my pain, you know, and that can be expressed verbally or non-verbally. You know, body, uh, motion, action, tone of voice is more important than the words. I'll give you an example. Let's see, it's my poor Chandra here again. I say, let's say I, I want to tell him, to, to hear the words, you are nice. Okay. So I can say it two ways. You're nice, Mayapur. Or I can say, you are nice, Mayapur. You know, sarcastically, it means completely different things with different body language. So, so empathy for others, and there's also empathy for oneself, but in this particular case, empathy for others is expressed more through tone of voice and body language than words. That's why when you go on the internet and, and you use email, you're just opening yourself up for conflicts when you're dealing with any difficult situation. There's always going to be, not always, but generally there'll be misunderstandings. And I see this. I mean, even in the GBC conference, we have misunderstandings because someone says something and you didn't really understand how or what they were saying. You just read the words and you interpreted the words in your own way. That's part of, part of conflict resolution when you first start learning about this thing. You, you uh, see different pictures and two people see pictures in a different way. You know, one person, I'll give you an example. I don't have those pictures here. One person will see a picture as an old lady and a witch. And the other person will look at the same picture and see a young girl. Has anyone gone through that sort of training? It's really interesting. So when you don't have adequate information, you can misinterpret things so many different ways. So getting back to the hospital situation, so sympathy would be basically to say about your pain after seeing him. Empathy would be uh, basically to put in, in simple language uh, your suffering. Because the person just said I'm suffering, you know, you're really in pain. I mean, you definitely have a, a need. You would address a person's need. You definitely have a need for a peaceful situation, a need for rest. And the person would feel connected with because of that. That's really important. Connecting with people. So the whole purpose of this seminar is to connect with people, to understand how to fulfill our needs. Now, for those of you in management positions, it's not a seminar on managing. Believe me. It's not a seminar how to manipulate, control people. Nor do, do we want to do that, because when you manipulate, control people with threats or with uh, different offerings, then people are not serving with their hearts. If, you know, if you want people to do the maximum, then you connect with them through... Uh, empathy through understanding. So just want to phrase that. So sometimes it may not be applicable to apply these principles, let's say in your workplace. You know, if you go to your boss and your boss is angry, you say, are you angry, boss? Because you have a need. <laughs> you have a need for love. It may not be the best strategy in that particular circumstance. So Anyway, so I noticed in, in, in religious institutions, ISKCON is not an exception, that there are a lot of non-empathic dealings and, you know, people calling each other names and stuff like that. And so I was sort of like shocked, freaked out, amazed to see that, you know, because I thought, you join the Hare Krishna movement, it's going to be, you know, because I'm a member of the, uh, I was, not anymore. I was a member of the 1960s generation, you know, peace, love. You know that song? Come on, everybody, you gotta love everybody right now. Some of you may have heard that song. So I thought you joined the movement, and it's like a big kumbaya. You know what kumbaya is? You know, everybody dances in a circle. A yeah, circle dance, kumbaya, you know. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be like that. Instead, I, I find, you know, there's conflicts, people saying bad, saying bad things about each other, and I'm thinking, oh my God. What's happening here? And then, due, due to the, some research, and there was research uh, done by 
a person named Joseph Campbell, who's quite famous actually, he was the one who did all the research for Star Wars movie. <laughs> but he was a, a sociologist and a historian. So he, he did some research and he found out that in religious institutions, 80% of the people are less empathic than the people in general. And 20% of the people in religious institutions are more empathic than the people in general. So you join a religion and you become less empathic? Oh my God, why should one join a religion <laughs> if you're less compassionate, less empathic when you join a religion? And I was thinking about that. And really that's due to the problem that all religions, including ourselves, have, which is we like to put labels on people. We got a lot of labels. You know, the Shastras have a lot of nice labels. And we're going to do it. You can tear that flip chart off. And we're going to deal with another flip chart here. It's, it's actually nice having less people here because we can use a flip chart. We were in Gita Nagari and there were so many people that we couldn't use any visuals. It was just like the room was filled with 250, over 250 people. It's nice having a smaller crew seated around in a circle. So what we're going to do is display what disconnects us in terms of our religious judgments. Because when you put a label, which religions are very expert at, put a label on someone, you see them as that label. We'll, we'll do a, a little play about that in a few seconds. Uh, Actually, maybe we should do the play now. This is, this is a really interesting exercise. Let me get my... I need two volunteers. And I will not abuse them. Nobody? Okay. Either two men or two women. Or two Matajis. That's a label. That's interesting. So, do, 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 do. Here we go. Okay. Now, you know each other? That's good. Better not to know each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what I'm going to do. Okay, who wants to be the one who's labeled? You don't mind? <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to give him a label. And when you look at him, you relate to him as his label. Okay, so just to show all of you, here's the label. Don't say... All right. I'll explain what it is later. You can guess. Here's your label. Thank you, Mark. Uh, how is it going to stick? Maybe your hair. Whoops. Can it stick? Yeah. Okay. So why don't you talk to him? Hello, you know, what's your name? Yeah, just, just relate to, you know, what do you do for a living? Yes, you, okay. And whatever, whatever, whatever questions you want to ask. <laughs> so where are you from? I'm from San Diego. San Diego is not a nice place. I heard uh, the devotees there are amazing. Of course, they are very amazing. Mm -hmm. And you, what are you going to do? What's your name, first thing? Yeah, I'm sorry for the Okay, I think we did enough. <laughs> so, 
So his label was he was an idiot. <laughs> if it went on, <laughs> all right, you sit down now. He was an idiot. So when you, like Prabhupada said, this is Prabhupada's expression, give the dog a bad name and hang him. Did you ever hear that expression before? That's Prabhupada's expression. So you, you put a label on someone and you see him or her as that label. So now we're going to go across so many interesting labels. Let's just take what I call negative labels. There's positive labels too. Okay, anybody have a label that we use in Krishna consciousness? Yeah. Demon. Demon. Non devotee. Non -devotee. Karmi. Karmi. Mean. What? Mean. Mean, mean person. Okay, mean person. Fanatic. Yeah, that's an internal. Yeah, internal labels are good too. Spaced out. Spaced out. Sectarian. Sectarian. Wrathful. Who? Wrathful. Wrathful? Rascal. Oh, yeah, rascal. That's one of my favorite. <laughs> Fallen. Fallen. Spontaneous. Spontaneous, all right. Spontaneous. I'm not sure whether that's negative or positive. Mostly negative. Sense gratifier. Kanishta. Can you keep up with all these negative labels? <laughs> Illusion, Maya. How about how about something you know like some sexist labels here? Loser. Loser. <laughs> you Montagi. <laughs> you know, usually, usually hear Montagi said in like a derogatory. You know, it's a tone of voice again. Non -Vedic. She's not Vedic, non Vedic. What? Huh? Sentimentalist. That's a good one. Feminist. Unchaste. Less intelligent. You got feminist. What? Proud. Nagging. Nagging. How, you know, how about witch, Maya Devi? I can think of a whole bunch of... Grahasta, yeah. Brahmachari. <laughs> yeah, Mochi. Mochi's a good one. We are rolling here. So I want you all to note down these names so we can use them. Any, Chandala. what? Chandala. Chandala. Of course, Maletra goes along with that too. Attached. Attached. I thought, I thought we did that. Attached. Attached. What about Creepana? Creepana. Fallen. Fallen. Attached. We can do this for several hours. <laughs> Shudra, oh, that's a good one. It's nice, isn't it? Makes you feel good about life. We're not the only ones. I mean, like, like let, let's say, let's say if a Christian was to see us here, he'd say, we're the devil. You know, he has to use a lot of ones. A Muslim would say, we're kafir or whatever. So there's all sorts of terms that every religion has to deal with other religions or other people or people within their religion who are not coming up to the mark. And as soon as you put those names on people, you're disconnected from them. So we fortunately have the most names of any religion <laughs> because we have the best philosophy, isn't it? The most elaborate philosophical statements. So we are better at disconnecting <laughs> When misapplied, when our philosophy is misapplied, we are better at disconnecting 
than practically anyone else. And of course, Krishna tells us in the uh, Isopanishad, Yastu Sarvani Bhutani Atmane Banu Pashati Sarva Bhutesha Chatmanam Tatona Vigigupshate. He says we should actually be connected, and I'm paraphrasing the verse, not a direct translation, because if we see everyone as connected to him, we will not hate anyone, we'll not put these labels on anyone. We'll see everyone as our brothers and sisters, right? This is Isopanishad, basic information in Krishna consciousness. We, we were trying to back up all this information with Shastra. So these are what we call static labels, which is the opposite of ecstatic. And nobody is static unless they're dead. <laughs> then they're pretty static. Static means no motion. All of us are dynamic, which is the opposite of static. We're changing. Like sometimes we may act like in a very sentimental way. That's true. Sometimes we may act in a very fanatical way. Sometimes, which, forget about it. <laughs> so, sometimes we, uh, you know, the, the wife may be nagging. But that's not the person. The person is what? Jivera Svarupa Hoi Nitya Krishna Das. Right? Isn't that our philosophy? Gopi Bharta Padakamala Dasa 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 Anu Dasa, isn't that what we learned? No? Yes? That's our designation. So now we're going to go over next flip chart. Very good. You're hired. I'm going to flip the flip chart, please. Now, now we're going to go over positive labels, which also are disconnecting. Pure devotee. Pure devotee. <laughs> What's that? Huh? Sadhu, sadhu. Okay, sadhu. Pure devotee, sadhu. Humble. Yeah. No, true spirit. True spirit. Pious. What? Pious. Pious. Austere. Paramahamsa. Advanced. No, these are in true spirit. These are what we call positive. Liberated soul. I feel so good when you call me these things. <laughs> kind. Understanding. Understanding. We have humble already. Devotional. Sadhu. I thought we had sadhu. Approachable. Perfect. That's for me. Uttama Adhikari. Kanishta we did before. Pre preacher? No, patient. Patient. Tolerant. Mature devotee. Okay. I think we got enough of those. So, these are also static labels. And they don't really connect with a person. They may help one's false ego. We all like the false ego, right? Yes? No? We all love a false ego. So, because someone who praises me, as the Shastras say, is my enemy, right? And someone who chastises me is my friend. So, <laughs> so these are labels 
that really disconnect our, us from ourselves and don't make us enthusiastic. I mean, for example, let's say I'm giving this seminar and afterwards someone says, you were so great. What does that do for me? It makes me, actually it'll interfere with my spiritual life. It makes me think, I am great. Just like uh, if one happens to be a guru in the Hare Krishna movement, what do you get every year? A whole book written about yourself. Isn't that nice? Who wants to be a guru? Everybody. No. <laughs> you ladies are missing out on this, you know. <laughs> Can you imagine a whole book written telling you how nice, how pious, how pure you are, how humble you are, how your Paramahamsa advanced liberated is so simple, kind, merciful, understanding. Wow. And I sit and read my book every night before I go to sleep. <laughs> and encourages me. No. So the point is, if we want to really be encouraged in Krishna consciousness, then we get back to these needs again. Someone will say, let's say if someone says to me, after I gave the seminar, you know, when you said something about disconnection and how labels disconnect me, I, I felt a relief because I have a need for understanding. That's one of the things here, not particularly mentioned. You know, acceptance or appreciation, or appreciation. Let's say appreciation, like that. And I feel encouraged, but I don't feel encouraged to toot my horn or be proud. I feel encouraged to go on teaching and go deeper into studying. Like if I'm giving class, let's say I'm giving Bhagavatam class, and someone says, wow, you're a pure devotee. That doesn't do anything for me. But if someone says, when you made this specific philosophical point, it really wanted, encouraged me to study Prabhupada's books more and more and chant more sincerely, wow! Then I feel really encouraged and I will study more, I will preach more, I will read more of Prabhupada's books. So these labels are a disconnection and in religious life, we're accustomed to using them. Does everybody understand that point? Let's take a little break for questions right now. Does anyone have any? We touched upon a lot of points. Yeah. Uh, Mitch and Prime. Mike? Oh, here's the mic. Yeah. Yes. So when you're saying disconnect, right? It's from a like how to disconnect. Right? I mean you gave an example. Yeah. Well, when we use them with each other. I mean there's Shastric descriptions which are completely accurate, you know, so it's a pure devotee, so it's a paramahansa. But the, the the injunction is that when we praise someone without connecting about what they did, like like there's an example, like Prabhupada was in a car one time with a disciple, and the disciple was saying, oh, you're so wonderful, you're wonderful, Prabhupada. And Prabhupada is going, Hare Krishna. You know, so of course it's the disciples, let's say duty, responsibility, to appreciate the spiritual master. But what encourages someone in this world, you know, in face-to-face -face dealings, is appreciation. We have a need for appreciation. It's right there. We have a need for appreciation and be appreciated by what I did for someone rather than who I am. That's much more encouraging because we don't want to make people proud because we've seen time and time again, Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about, it was in the Harinam Chintamani, that one of the causes of anarthas, the final cause of anarthas, is the byproducts of bhakti. Does anyone remember that? And what does that mean? As you advance, people praise you. And then when people <laughs> praise you, it can go to your head. You start to believe. I mean, I always give the example. You start to believe that you have lotus feet. 
right? And then, then you have someone, you, a yoga teacher, teach you the yoga posture where you can take your own foot and put it on your head. <laughs> you thought about it. Yeah, it's good. You know, so, so one of the, we have to, we don't have to, but it's necessary to develop humility to advance in devotional service. So therefore, that's the statement Lord Chaitanya said, gave that uh, praising, you know, praising is prohibited. But of course, I mean, there can be some praising, but general, generally, my understanding is the praising should be in terms of what someone has done. Like, let's take Prabhupada, for example. I can say, Prabhupada is wonderful. Yeah, true. But that, I'm not really connected to Prabhupada. If I say, praise Prabhupada, like Prabhupada got on a boat, risked everything, uh, had two heart attacks uh, for the purpose of saving us, of bringing us to Krishna Khan, giving us a goal in life. I mean, that's much more powerful than just saying Prabhupada's wonderful. Much more powerful than doing, than doing that. You know, praising someone, appreciating someone for what they did. Good, good question. Sandy, yes. Okay, microphone. You don't have to do it, but you should do it. So, you believe my absolutely my personal life and the situation I'm in touch. Uh, some of them have expressed that they will join the movement to solve so many things. Yes. Because it's fulfilling a certain need. Good. But as years go by, and because of the circumstance, spiritual, you know, Krishna, the Allah, the universe, and all that happens, yeah. it somehow becomes. Well, needs are also dynamic. So our needs may change or manifest. One may become more important than another one. So it requires developing an internal strategy to determine why am I feeling like that? You know, why am I feeling I have to? And it's basically because certain needs are not being fulfilled. I mean, give me an example. I joined the movement, and in the Brahmacharya Ashram, we all slept on the floor. Uh, we had much more austere than your Brahmacharis here. There were 30 Brahmacharis in one room the size, not even the size of this room, it was the size of where the chairs are. And we all shared our own clo uh, same clothes, everything like that, and I was happy. But as I got older, or as the body got older, then there were more needs for, you know, rest. You know, I was happy getting by on one half hour of sleep at night. And taking, taking rest every time you stopped at a stoplight, you know. You, anyone have that experience? <laughs> Mitch and I Brian had that experience. Every time you get, you say, thank God for red lights, you know. <laughs> And then you're, you're woken up by the horn behind you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't get in the accident. So uh, I was very happy, you know, enough shelter, protection, food, water. You know, all those things were fulfilled at that particular point. As I got older, you know, I probably had need for more rest. And things morphed a little bit. You know, things morphed. And, you know, I would say my need for autonomy increased because you know when I was a brahmachari I was very this is, I'm making a display of these labels I was very humble submissive wonderful devoted and pure so <laughs> perfect brahmachari I mean this but when, when I when, when I was a brahmachari I was traveling 
early in the uh, movement. I was traveling with a sannyasi whose name shall remain secret to protect the innocent. Uh, and he was very heavy. In those days, sannyasis were extremely heavy. Nowadays, they're kind and gentle <laughs> and loving. <laughs> Isn't it? But in those days, I remember the sannyasi telling me, as I was traveling with Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj, who was my good friend, and he, we would always be crying together. <laughs> he was chastising us all the time. And, you know, and, 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 and I would assure him, we're getting purified. <laughs> you know, when you, when you join the movement, you get purified in all sorts of different ways. You know, too many red peppers, you have digestive problems. <laughs> You get you're getting all the bad stuff out of your body and all the <laughs> you've heard that before? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the cathartic, yeah. This is getting all the anarthas are coming out because you <laughs> So everything was purification. So you know we travel actually this story involves Chicago too. Wow. Anyway, so I could tell the story. So so anyway, I was traveling with this sannyasi and it, it was really heavy. We were always crying. At one time he chastised me and I said, but I didn't do it. And he says, it doesn't matter if you did it or not. You're guilty because you have a material body. You, <laughs> did you ever hear that one before? You came to the material world. That is your sign of guilt. You're walking around with a flesh and blood body. And I thought, ooh, I gotta get out of here. So I had a need for autonomy. So we, we were I was traveling with him. Actually, uh, just remembering this story, we stopped by the Chicago Temple. And I said, I have to stay here. I can't take this any longer. <laughs> so I, I stayed in the Chicago Temple as a temple commander, actually, in the, uh, Evanston, Illinois. Temple commander. And then uh, my need for autonomy was being met in that particular case. But then along came, this is even the fun. You know, I was here for the uh, installation of Gishore Gishore, which I mentioned before, and I was a temple commander during that time, living in a swimming pool, which didn't have any water in it, but anyway, <laughs> and dressed the deities. So then along came two other sannyasis, which also should remain nameless. I guess I can mention Guru Kripa and Yashoda Nanda Maharaj. And <laughs> they, they said, well, we want this brahmacharya me with them. I thought, well, I'll join their party and have fun. And I discovered it was like going from the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> and so, anyway, I, I ended up, because of my need for autonomy, I ended up chastising the sannyasis and ended up in San Diego. Anyway, there's a whole story. <laughs> and, I and I took their deities away from them. Anyway, because this rebellion, you know, you can say he's rebellious. That's one thing. You put that label on me, you know, that's not there. But he's rebellious, but it was my need for autonomy. You know, you could put a label on me, but it was my need to make my own decisions in life and not be, you know, controlled all the time. So as, as I experienced different things, different needs became prominent. And had I not accepted, the problem with not expressing that need, I'll tell you. The problem with not expressing that need is you give up your autonomy. The problem with doing that is you lose your sense of moral judgment and ethical judgment. And we saw that happen with, with some devotees. When you just follow orders, what does that sound like? It follow, sounds like World War II, Germany, doesn't it? I mean, maybe nothing will happen. Maybe your authority will be perfect. I mean, that's proper, practical. But in, in many cases, you won't, you will lose your moral compass. Moral compass means that not everything or every circumstance you come across is under the jurisdiction of some Shastra conjunction. There's many judgment calls in life. And when you're used to being what I call institutionalized, you know, just following orders, then you can do things that are actually counterproductive to Krishna consciousness or counterproductive to ethics and morality. And we've seen that in our movement. 
And of course, as I mentioned, Germany is the best example of that. During World War II, people said at the Nuremberg trials, what was the main defense was? I was just following orders. Just following orders. And there's psychological tests or, or, or uh, studies that show that people can slip into that particular realm. There was that uh, story, uh, test about the shock machine, how someone was told to give other people shocks to, to help them learn. It's a learning experience. And they increased the shocks on the order of the person, the teacher, up to about 450 degrees. Of course, the person wasn't actually getting shocks. He was acting like he was getting shocks. But the person who was being told to give the shocks actually did it. Because he sacrificed his own autonomy, his own need for autonomy, which is very dangerous to sacrifice your need for autonomy. So, so, so the point, to answer your question, the, the, the prominence of the needs changes with time. Okay, good. Uh, you define empathy as understanding other people's feelings. And feelings. Yeah, feelings. So self empathy means uh, you know, identifying your own uh, feelings. And, and needs. And taking responsibility for them. For them. So I personally find time in my life and also many people that come and talk to me that they find that very helpful and, and even some of the ladies I'm not into it, I was taking on a date then. Is where do you draw a line between the needs of the institution and your own needs? Because somehow it seems like there's always a conflict. Um, mm. There's a potential because there's so many labels and expectations mm -hmm. and thinking of shame or all those things, mm -hmm. maybe there's a thing. So you tend to push aside your own needs mm -hmm. and Good question. Um, the way I do it, I mean, just to give a practical example, is that uh, I think of the institution, because that word institution is very, has some negative connotations to it anyway. We're institutionalized. You're in the army now, you know. So I, I think of the institution as non different from Prabhupada's mission. So it's how I identify the institution. I don't, I don't, I don't really think, see it generally, I don't think as, as institution, I think Prabhupada's mission. And I connect that with my need to serve and connect with Prabhupada. It, has, it, it should be based on the individual need. You know, because the institution is meant to serve the members. Now, the members serve the institution, but that's not the, the, the reason for the institution. The reason for the institution is to serve the members and to bring more people to Krishna consciousness. So, my, uh, I'll, give, I'll give you a practical example of my involvement in the GBC. So, I don't like to manage, as Nishinanda Pran knows. I mean, usually during the, most of the meetings, I just remain silent. And just watch everything go back and forth, unless there's have, it's something that I really feel strongly about. Because it's not, it's not really in my blood. I mean, I much rather be up here, talking to people, reading Shastra. That just, you know, different natures. Different natures. So, for a while I was thinking, you know, I, I need to come to the, uh, me, I have to come to the meeting. So, I have to come to the meeting. And the meetings became really unpleasant for me as a result of that. I have to serve the institution, I have to, I have to. But then I started to think about the personal, because it has to be personal. As long as you keep things impersonal, personal, impersonal, there's no connection. Then I thought about my relationship with Prabhupada, how Prabhupada, like Prabhupada said about himself that he was never separated from his spiritual master. So I was thinking my main need 
in life is to be connected with Prabhupada, to do something that pleases Prabhupada. So I asked Prabhupada the question about the decisions I make in life. I mean, this is what I do. I'm not saying this is what you should do, or I'm just this is the practical way I've dealt with it, but it's, it is centered on me and my connection with Prabhupada. I asked Prabhupada the question, you know, should I quit the GBC? You know, I'm 69 years old, Social Security, Govardhan, here I come, you know, right back where I started from. <laughs> you know, my poor and Chumbuk have been with me in Govardhan, know that, you know, that's really, I love it. I could stay there 24 hours a day, you know, 366 day, days a year on leap year. <laughs> and I don't mind the weather, you know, if it gets hot, I sleep on the floor, the floor keeps me cool. I'd be right, I'd love to be there. So, but I asked Prabhupada the question, because to me, Prabhupada's, the connection with Prabhupada is the most important factor in my life. So I asked Prabhupada the question, what should I do? Go over down? or remain in the GVC right now. <laughs> Notice I just said right now. Anyways, <laughs> and Prabhupada said, work now, samadhi later. You know, and then, and then my needs are, are, because I'm connected to Krishna then. So in other words, I'm connecting the institutional needs, which I don't phrase as an institution, to my need to connect to Prabhupada and to connect to the devotees and to, to do something substantial for Prabhupada. I mean, every day, you know, I wake up and I, I think, I got to do something substantial for Prabhupada. Because to me, the connection to Prabhupada is number one. I mean, I'm not saying that's everybody. Maybe there's that other ways to phrase it in one's mind. Or maybe the connection to your friends. Because the institution has your friends. Let's say, let's say, or your guru. You know, my spiritual master is Prabhupada. And, you know, that's just the way it is. And, and so, so everybody has different reasons. They connect to the deities. I want Kishore Kishori to be happy. So, so it's a matter of connecting to your need. And you don't have to do it. You don't have to do anything. There's nothing that you have to do. I always give the example that if someone points a gun at your head and says, give me your money, do you have to do it? You have a choice. You could say no and die. Go back to Godhead, you know. <laughs> Just go, I mean, because you know when you're going to die. It's actually good. It's like Maharaj Pariksit. Do it now. Just give me a second notice. Hare Krishna! <laughs> Boom! Here I come, Krishna. So, so uh, it involves a little introspection, or a lot of introspection. And then the very same thing, you know, like going into the GBC meetings or something like that, 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 that could have been extremely unpleasant. Also, it helps to have a mobile phone to play with during the meetings, but that's another issue. <laughs> so so what, what could have been extremely unpleasant now becomes, you know, ecstatic expression of love for Srila Prabhupada. But it took some thinking. Because, you know, there's so many thoughts that go through the mind, like, why do I have to do this? I've been doing this for so many years. You know, all these thoughts are going through my mind. Let someone else do it, you know. You know, where does it say you have to be miserable in Krishna? <laughs> anyway. So these are all thoughts, and those thoughts are good because those thoughts are judgments, and those thoughts help me understand that there's, a, there's some need that needs to be fulfilled. But if I were to relinquish the service, then I'd be not fulfilling a very important need. Is that, we connect? Okay. Next question. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes, when you are absolutely pure devotee, so, it works. It, it works like <laughs> it works like that. Although we see with most pure devotees, like Sri Prabhupada, Prabhupada definitely took care of his physical needs. What? What? How many hours a day did Prabhupada uh, get a massage for? Two or three hours a day. Wow. I mean, if any of you brahmacharis had a massage for two or three hours a day, <laughs> even ten minutes. I mean, wow, wasn't Prabhupada doing that? Prabhupada would go for a walk, air. Prabhupada had a cook, Shruti Kirti was his cook. And Prabhupada would get upset if the Jupatis were not puffed up and warm. They had to run the, isn't it my boy? You know the story, it's his father. They had to run the Jupatis from the kitchen like that and Prabhupada would Put a spoon to the japati and see if there's hot air that came out of it. Otherwise, probably reject it. Wouldn't that be nice to have? All you men should have your wives do that. <laughs> That's the proper wife. You know, she has to cook hot chapatis. And, you know, so Prabhupada definitely was very conscious. And, and when they tried to give Prabhupada a diet like I follow, you know, <laughs> Prabhupada said, let the starvation committee go to hell. <laughs> right? So, I mean, look, look at Prabhupada's example. Prabhupada is giving an example for us. I mean, I do not think that the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, their external example is for us. I'm not going to sleep two hours every two days or three days. I'm not going to eat a pat of butter every two days. I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not going to walk around in a coping. <laughs> you know, I, I have to be practical. And Prabhupada, see, Prabhupada is our Acharya, you know, founder of Acharya. He sets the example. So Prabhupada also was very joking. You know, he, he would joke with people. You know, there was one devotee who was talking about the moonshot. And he, he thought, well, we have gone to the moon. It was a whole discussion. And then he went into the kitchen, he cooked something, and there was an explosion. There was soot all over him. And Prabhupada joked and said, he has gone to the moon. <laughs> That's a joke. Prabhupada joked. Prabhupada had recreation in his walk. Prabhupada loved appreciation, closeness with his disciples. He had loving relationships with his disciples. Uh, supporting, trusting, understanding, warm relationships. And each of the relationships with each of his disciples was different. I mean, for example, with Sri Takirti Prabhu, Prabhupada never yelled at him, never chastised him. I asked Sri Takirti that. I was just with him in Hawaii a few months ago. I said, Prabhupada never chastised you? No. Because he knew Sri Takirti well. And then if you ask someone like Sasvarup Maharaj or uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, the Prabhupada was chastised him. Gopal Krishna Maharaj, it was interesting. He was afraid to come in front of Prabhupada unless he had a new book, a new published book. So there was individuality in the relationship. So I take Prabhupada's example. You know, Prabhupada had a, a need for autonomy. You know, you, all the examples with his wife. <laughs> Prabhupada even celebrated. He had a big celebration even when Mr. Nair passed away. <laughs> or when they won the Mumbai temple. They celebrated, they had a big celebration. And you know, and, and you see all these things manifest in Prabhupada. Now, if you've got someone in the scenario of Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, Haridas, Thakur, that's different. You know, when you, Prabhupada came down to our platform to show us how to be a devotee. Prabhupada is my role model. We all function on the basis of role models. People we really admire, we want to be like. Some of you have Bollywood stars as your role models. You know, like Vivek Oberoi or Rani Mukherjee or something like that. They're both devotees. That's why I mentioned their names. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we should, we should have role models that actually inspire us in Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada really inspires me. And what Prabhupada did, and I try to be, I can't imitate, I can try to be like that. And uh, yes, 
when one is absolutely Krishna conscious, no more material needs, you're in samadhi, om, shanti, 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 you know. But, uh, I mean, if someone's like that, raise your hand here if you're on that platform. Okay, one person, two people on that platform. Okay, you have no need for food, water, air, light. <laughs> or love, you know, tell your wife that. <laughs> I mean, sure, help her day, not having to cook for you or do anything for you anymore. Just get to work. So, anyway, does that answer the question? Okay, any other questions here? Yes, Ms. Underbrook. Yeah. Yes. Correct. And I should be okay with that because for me, astronomy is far more important than the other things. But when I want multiple things to be focused. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you asked a very cogent question there. So we don't concentrate on one need and we pick strategies that don't interfere with other needs. Like I, about myself, I mentioned my need for autonomy might, you know, on that basis I might say, let me just go to Govardhan, goodbye cruel world. But this other need of connecting to Krishna and Prabhupada would not be there in uh, meaning. There wouldn't be any meaning to my, because the meaning of my life is serving Prabhupada. There wouldn't be no celebrations. There would be no community. So if that's not a good strategy, the whole point is to develop strategies, which is our responsibility. When I'm counseling people, I don't tell them what to do. That is probably the worst thing you can do when you're counseling people. I facilitate people in understanding what their needs are. That's it. And then they can develop a proper strategy that, that they own for fulfilling their own needs. And remembering all the needs are important. Depending on a particular situation, one may be more prominent than another need, but this is part of spiritual life for all of us. So, does that answer the question? Yeah. question. Good question. Yeah. And I found it at that juncture that the strategy for me was I can connect in a more wholesome manner right. if I do something else. At least for the time being, that's what I did. So it, it's not necessary that I'm happy yeah. reflecting, but it may not be necessary to continue, but it's more important to develop the strategy. What, what's the best strategy to please the spiritual master? That's the way I look at it. And let me ask you a question. I know the answer to it, but I'm just going to ask, ask you a question. So when you gave up being temple president, who took over? The wife. The wife. <laughs> I know the answer. I know the answer. And so you didn't give up being temple president. So, so you came up with a win-win strategy. It's a good strategy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you get the praise, things are going on, and things go on. 
Like, like in my particular situation, yes, if I had someone who could take over for me, you know, succession is called, that then, and I could do other service, other service and increase my service, increase my connection, sure. But I don't, you know, any volunteers here? Anyone want to? <laughs> any, anyway, anyone want to lose their mind managing the voters? Anyway. So, so that's the point. The point is to maximize the connection. One has to set priorities in life too. I mean, that's that's part that's part of living in the material world or functioning in Krishna consciousness or functioning outside the world. And if we, if we don't think like this, then we enter into this niyam niyam agraha business. You have to go, or uh, yeah, I, I just want to address that one point. Like Krishna, this is very interesting. It's, it's something I touched upon in Gita Nagari that. We know Achahara, Prayasas Cha, Bajal, Niyamagraha, Jana Sangas, Dalayam Cha, Sabir Vakivanashati. That there are several things that disconnect us from Krishna. And I'm not going to talk about eating too much, eating too little. That's, don't want to threaten anyone here. So, uh, but one of them is Niyamagraha. There's two things Niyamagraha, Niyamagraha. I'll translate. Niyamagraha means not following the rules and regulations. But niyam agraha means to follow rules and regulations without being connected. In other words, ritualistically. You know, why am I chanting? I have to. That's niyam agraha right there. And then as a result of that, you become like a ritualistic Brahmin. And as a result of that, you become disconnected from Krishna. As a result of that, you're doing everything externally, but you're not even aware of what you're doing or understand the wise intentions of why you're doing what you're doing. It's like, like you're chanting the Guru Vashtika prayers for Mangalarti. And you're not really thinking of what they mean. Here's another big one. You chant the Prashadam prayer. How many people here know the meaning, you know, the word by word meaning of the Prashadam prayer that you chant? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. And he chanted every time he prashad him. What is it? Shurira Vidija, right? And you're chanting the same thing. Wow, that's Krishna unconsciousness right there. You remember the Krishna unconsciousness movement. You don't, you're saying something, you don't know what you're saying. No wonder you're disconnected from Krishna. You're saying the Guru Vashtaka. No wonder you're disconnected from your guru. It's just that, you know, it's your song, and it's the song in the morning. Some people call it the samsara prayer. It's not the samsara prayer. <laughs> samsara prayer means you're praying, praying for material entanglement. <laughs> Isn't it? Please entangle me in this material world. No, it's the, <laughs> it's the eight prayers of glorification of the guru. The spiritual master is receiving benediction from the ocean of mercy. All the living entities are in fire, the material energy is in fire. It's really amazing prayer. And if you think about what you're doing, you become happy. But we are very ritualistic. We have rituals, nothing wrong with rituals. But we don't think of why we're doing what we're doing when we're doing them. And that's why we feel disconnected. And that's why Devotional service gets dry after some time. You know, you're dancing around Tulsi. Yani kani chapapani brahmachiti yani chatani tani brahmachiti. Parikshana pade pade. With every step, you know, if you were actually thinking of what you're doing, you could understand you could kill a Brahmin. <laughs> and get away with it, right? Isn't that what it means? 
It's cool, isn't it? I got a lot of people I'd like to kill, you know, just, <laughs> just keep Chelsea there. So, so, yeah, so, so, so really, we need to be thinking of what we're doing, and then it, it's, such, it's so wonderful. Krishna consciousness is so wonderful. When you're chanting Japa, you know, if I, I had time to do this whole series of seminars, we could do a whole session on chanting, how to chant and connect to the holy name. We did, we did a whole seminar on that in Europe last year. So, anyway, that's important. You have a question? Okay. Yeah. And the it's called it's kissing someone's whatever. <laughs> it was bootlegger, you know, liquor. There's so many different expressions for that. And so. But you, but you can do that internally. Like there's a, this interesting two words, please and thank you. You know. Connect, connecting with people. Yeah, you, people don't have the patience for you to go through the whole thing. You know, when you did this, when you did that. Just, just a thank you. That, that was really helped with the get to a solution. Especially dealing with software. You can say, you know, that really helped find the solution. And you, you're feeling, you're, you yourself are connecting to your needs and feelings. Obviously, you don't want to go through this whole spiel, you know, the whole discussion. When you did this, yeah, that, that's one of the uh, complaints that a lot of people have about nonviolent communication. Because the, the process, which you're going to be learning about this afternoon and tomorrow, is a process of uh, you know, observations. Here we see observations, feelings, needs, strategies, requests. I'll explain that this afternoon. Uh, if you just express that in like a ritualistic language, like when you did this, let's say, Mr. Jones, when uh, you did this, I felt really good and really happy because, you know, I had a need for understanding. You'll drive people crazy. That's a complaint people have about others who practice nonviolent communication. I was uh, talking to Braja Bihari Prabhu who went, got trained up in, uh, you know, he has a degree, was a master's, a PhD and conflict resolution, and whenever he met someone who was from the NBC school, he, it would drive him crazy, because they would always use the same expression. Are you feeling this because you, I don't know, I'm feeling this, or are you feeling this because you have a need for love? Would you be willing to tell me how you feel? You know, just, ah. it, So this is it's like an internal processing, it requires practice. So let, you, you can just do it non-verbally. You know, let's say someone has done something at work, you know, thank you. And you, you're understanding what you're thanking them for. That's appreciation. Communication, communication is mostly non-verbal and tone of voice, yeah. Another question. Give me a practical example. Workplace example. Workplace example. Uh, I, I'm taking a situation where my, uh, if someone near to me, manager or someone is more, uh, not giving that personal space, being more uh, uh, invasive uh, or micromanaging. So that would be something where. These are labels, yeah.
Well, that, that involves requests rather than demands. I mean, you don't, you don't have to express everything, but you would be aware of your needs, aware of the other person's needs. It, like I said, it takes practice. And you would request, would you be willing to give me more time to figure this out on my own? You know, it has to be a request, which we're going to be talking about later, is something that if they don't do it, you're all right with it too. A demand is something, it's not the language, it's something that if they don't do it, you're going to get angry, you're going to get depressed, you're going to do something. So you, it, it's a question of making requests and being a little detached from the situation. Because the point is that you can't control people, you can't manipulate people. You, you, can, be, you can control yourself. You have that responsibility. I mean, let's take the uh, sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the chapter of yoga. It's a, it says that one, atmanam, uh, atmanaiba, so it says that one should control the mind. You are responsible for controlling the mind. In other words, you have personal responsibility. This is one of the blocks of, re, of communication we're going to talk about later. Your responsibility is for yourself. You can't control anyone else's mind, manipulate anyone else. Or control anyone else. And that's what Bhagavad Gita teaches us. One must elevate himself by himself or elevate, control the mind by itself. That's personal responsibility. Uh, I believe it's the fifth or sixth verse in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is do what you can do to be empathic yourself if you want to do that. If you want it, it's purely voluntary. And it's up to other people to respond. But what I've found in many cases that if you're empathic with others, if one person is that way, the other person will pick up on it. It's the mood, it's the tone of voice. Because if you use words too often, they'll be misinterpreted. Even in the workplace. But it's not, it's not a system of management. I'm not teaching you how to manage. It's not a management course. This is a personal development course teaching you how to connect with others and connect with your own needs. You know, there are other management strategies that can be taught better than this. I mean, because you have to have the discrimination when to apply different strategies. For example, <clears throat> in Marshall Rosenberg's organization, nonviolent communication organization, it, they basically fall apart because they don't know how to manage. Yeah, they're so empathic with each other that, they, you know, basically there's more conflicts. <laughs> so there, there's a time and place for everything depending upon your needs and strategies in a particular situation. So one more question. We have to end at 1230. Time passes quickly when you're having a good time. Yeah. When I was dealing with that sannyasa, you should remain nameless. Yeah. The solution was that I had to express my autonomy by coming here to Chicago. And fortunately, I got to see Kishore Kishori uh, installed. It may be. It's not, it's not a solution for changing people. It may, may or may not be. But it's important to be in tune with one's own needs. I mean, uh, of course, you know, at the same time, to make a big excuse, we were all young at that time, you know, we were like 22 years old. The movement when Prabhupada left the planet uh, basically was being run by a bunch of kindergartners, <laughs> which is true, you know. You know, everybody, I mean, how old are you right now? 37? What? 35. You're 35. So, you know, when I was 35, I, I was a sannyasa, I took sannyasa at 28, and I think I was a guru, whatever. You know, I was absolute when I was 35. <laughs> I, I was in the absolute platform, you know, basically pure devotee. <laughs> so, so, you have to understand, we went through a lot of things. These are growing pains that are quite understandable when you have a bunch of kids in charge of a major religious institution. <laughs> so, I mean, what would I do nowadays? Nowadays, I would, I would actually express myself and express my needs in 
a non-confrontational way and saying, you know, maybe it's not the best thing for me to travel with you anymore. And that's basically what I did anyway. Chicago was great. All my needs were being met here. So uh, it's 12.30. And so we're going to meet again at 2.30, 2.30, right? 2.30 to 4.30 is the afternoon session. So we want to thank everybody for coming this morning. And we're going to, have, we're going to go through more of the process. This, this morning was more or less introduction. And there's a, I mean, I, we could give this seminar, oh, sticking. Uh, we could give this seminar for several weeks. There's a lot of different things in here. Some of the things we, we're going to talk about this afternoon, blocks and communication, which we basically went over in a, in a non-structured way this morning. Tools for change. There, later tomorrow, we'll talk about anger, how to, get, how to deal with anger, how to say no. How to raise, well, raising children is not so important here because we did that in Gita Nagri and there's Brahmacharya too. Uh, dealing with habits, beliefs that don't meet our needs. Oh, one, one thing I wanted to put, read here before we end this morning is that here I am talking about a need for love. And it's strange for Sanyasi to talk about that. So I just want to recite some strategies. Actually, Prabhupada said, but a pure devotee, a pure lover of God, he loves everyone, just like we are. Wow, that's a powerful statement. So there's studies. In 1950, this was from Harvard, 126 men were chosen, and follow-up was done 35 years later. Uh, and 91% of the participants who said they didn't have a warm relationship with their mothers had serious chronic diseases like high blood pressure, uh, ulcers, alcoholism, and heart disease. Amongst those who had a, a loving relationship with their mothers, only 45% had these diseases. Wow. That's a pretty interesting statistic, isn't it? Mm. Uh, 1960, there's just one other one. 19, this is from my book. If anyone's interested in getting a copy of this book, Realizing Our Empathic Nature Connected to Krishna. It's available at Seed Champaka. During the seminar, we have quite a few of the books. We sold them out in uh, Gita Nagri. Uh, or, uh, 1965, almost 7,000 men and women were studied in this country near San Francisco. It was shown those who lacked social and community ties were 3.1, or 310% times more likely to die. Wow, during the nine-year follow-up, during nine years. That means roughly three times, a little bit more than three times more likely to die. So these needs are important not only you know, psychologically, but physically too. You want to be happy. I mean, I want to be happy. I want to be happy. I don't want to be miserable. Prabhupada said, Turn hippies to happies. And our motto, our uh, vision statement is more devotees, happier devotees. So we want all of you to be happy. Prabhupada, another thing Prabhupada said before we end was Prabhupada said uh, the business of the temple president <laughs> is to make sure that all the devotees are getting enough to eat and are jolly. Two things. If you can do that, you're doing your duty. Okay. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai.